Well, uh, we're definitely honored to have you here, Dr. Nadler, as our guest tonight to discuss your book, Manasseh ben Israel, Rabbi of Amsterdam. Uh, the book has been praised by, among others, the Jerusalem Post magazine, which calls it first, a first-class biography and highly revelatory. Uh, Jonathan Israel of the Institute for Advanced Study called it a truly excellent book from every point of view. Um, now, in fine academic tradition, I know you've got a 19-page resume online. Uh, it's full of academic leadership positions, honors, articles, books, everything you can imagine, so I'm just going to cover a couple of highlights. Um, Professor Nadler is the William H. Hay II Professor of Philosophy and the F. G. Bascom Professor of Humanities at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is both a philosopher and an historian of philosophy, and I guess you also are an expert in certain fields of art. Expert might be stretching it, but... <laughs> um, well, at least Rembrandt. Um, and um, he is a leading expert on 17th century philosophers like Descartes and Spinoza. Um, he has uh, been a Pulitzer Prize finalist. He's been the author of numerous books, including Rembrandt's Jews, and Spinoza, A Life, and A Book Forged in Hell, which is about Spinoza's um, uh, theological political treatise. Um, he um, also recently convinced a major academic press in an amazing feat, I think, uh, to publish an intellectual history of the 17th century in graphic format. Uh, it's called Heretics, The Wondrous and Dangerous Beginnings of Modern Philosophy, and I gather you're going to be talking to our millennials about that, among other things, this weekend. Um, your visit's especially timely, in my view, because much of your work involves how the world was transformed from a medieval one ruled by superstition and fear to a modern one ostensibly ruled by reason and facts. I can only observe that the story of this transition has renewed interest for all of us today, given contemporary events. We're very pleased to have you here with us for several events this weekend and to kick off our learning tonight. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Nadler. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here today, um, and thanks for coming out. Um, for me, this is balmy, uh, balmy weather coming from Wisconsin. I thought I'd begin um, by reading uh, the opening uh, passages from the book, which detailed the torture sessions of, of a certain individual who just happens to be Manasseh's father in Lisbon. As Gaspar Rodriguez Nunez sat in his cell waiting for his fourth session with the Lisbon Inquisition, he was in excruciating pain. His three previous stints on the rack and the hoist had seriously damaged his 39-year-old body. During the first round of torture on August, 8, on August 28, 1656, Gaspar was stripped naked and bound with cords attached to his arms and legs. He was then given several twists on the rack across his body. According to the Inquisitioner's report, the defendant continually screamed for help. When he was commanded to confess his sins, and the sins would have been practicing Judaism in secret because this family, like many families in Portugal at the time, were ostensibly Catholics but forced to convert to Catholicism after generations of Judaism. And the Inquisition did not care if you were Jewish. It did care if you were a Christian who was practicing Judaism in secret, and that was the suspicion of this family. Gaspar defended his innocence. The torturer was directed to apply more pressure and was rather focused in his method. In view of his saying that he had nothing to say, a twist was added to the first one in the flesh of both arms. And since he said nothing, he was given another twist in addition to the first in the muscle of the right arm near the hand. This is from the Inquisition testimony. After given a month to reflect on his offenses and to heal somewhat, Gaspar was once again subjected to this cruel examination, despite the fact that the first torture, and this is a quote from the documents, the first torture had not been properly carried out because of the mishap which Gaspar seemed to have suffered. Apparently, he had fainted and his limbs swelled up so that the session ended prematurely. <laughs> 
Still, he confessed nothing. On the third occasion, the, inquisitors, the inquisition was nothing if not persistent. On the third occasion, the inquisitors decided that hanging him by his arms tied behind his back might be a more effective technique than the rack. This time, Gaspar did indeed confess. He said that while he had been, born, while he had been baptized as a child and lived outwardly as a Catholic for decades, he was a Jew and had believed in the law of Moses for the last 16 or 17 years. He admitted, that is, to being a Judaizing converso, one of many so-called new Christians who raised in a family that several generations earlier had been forcibly converted from the Jewish to the Catholic faith, continued to practice their ancestral religion in secret. The Lisbon authorities were not satisfied with Gaspar's confession. It seems he had not named enough names. And so yet another torture session was scheduled for early February 1597. It was now almost four years since Gaspar's arrest, and he was a broken man, both mentally and physically. <laughs> Gaspar told his examiners that his arms were in a bad way and that he would not be able to withstand further torture. According to the physician who examined him before the next round, and this is a quote from the physician in the documents, Gaspar was not fit for having his hands brought behind his back for tying because during the hoisting torture some time ago, his right shoulder was dislocated and was reset in a plaster, which is still on him. In light of this, the members of the Holy Tribunal decided that this was enough. Gaspar Rodriguez Nunez, maimed in his right arm and hand and his body covered with lesions, was released from prison on February 27th. He was ordered to appear in auto de fe, that is an act of faith, a confessional uh, event, where he would be reconciled with the church. He was forced to give up all of his property, accept a form of house arrest, attend mass regularly, and wear the San Benito, this uh, garment uh, with a pointed cap and a cross on it, outside the home. What may have made Gaspar's experience yet more painful was the identity of the person who had denounced him. It was his wife, Felipe Rodriguez, who had been in custody for suspicion of Judaizing since October 1591. And she, in turn, had been denounced by her cousin and confessed that she and Gaspar had been observing Jewish fast for some time. Her statements impugned not only her husband, but his father, Alvaro Rodriguez, who was arrested with his son. And Felipe's denunciation of her father-in-law was backed up by none other than his own daughter, Gaspar's sister, Branca Marcus. Um, it's a sad story. And just a few years later, it was clear that the Inquisition was once again interested in this family. And rather than take their chances again in prison and on the torturer's rack, um, Gaspar and his family decided they'd be best off leaving Portugal altogether. And so around 1610, or 1608, somewhere between 1608 and 1610, um, they left Portugal, spent a bit of time in Madeira, which is off the coast of Portugal, the southwest coast of Portugal, then ended up in La Rochelle, France, which was a relatively safe, safe place for conversos. It wasn't a safe place yet for Jews, but it was a bit further from the Inquisition's reach. Eventually, however, by 1610, the family had settled in Amsterdam. And the, um, by that point, um, Amsterdam was openly allowing Jews to practice. Uh, can everybody see this clearly? Um, is there a way of dimming or brightening this? This is not Manasseh. This is a... Um, an etching by Rembrandt. Okay, thanks. This is an etching by Rembrandt, which for a long time was believed, or at least claimed to be, a portrait of Manasseh, but it's not. So, this is not Manasseh either. Uh, this is a painting by Robert Flink, who was um, a student of Rembrandt's. Um, and this, too, had believed, been believed for a long time to be a portrait of Manasseh, but we now know that it's not. Uh, it's an unknown sitter. This is Manasseh. 
Um, it's a portrait done by a Jewish artist in Amsterdam named Salim Italia for, as a frontispiece for one of Manasseh's books. Um, there's some dispute about where Manasseh was born. I'm certain, um, based on things he says and some other evidence, that he was born in Lisbon, even though he at some point says he was born uh, in Madeira. But I think all the evidence points to the fact that he was born in Lisbon in 1604. The family settled in Amsterdam, um, and that blue arrow indicates, as far as we know, where Manasseh's family's house was and where he lived for the rest of his life as long as he was in Amsterdam. Um, that main street um, running parallel to the Blue Arrow is now called the Jode Breestraat, the Jews Broad Street. In the early 17th century, and maybe even the final years of the 16th century, um, a, lar a significant number of Portuguese merchants, that's what they call themselves, Portuguese merchants, settled in Amsterdam. They fled both from Portugal and Spain directly, um, fleeing usually around the Mediterranean, settling in, um, in Italy, in Venice, in Salonika, in Hamburg, uh, but also in Antwerp. In Antwerp, you were not allowed to practice Judaism, but again, even though it was within the Spanish dominion, uh, the Inquisition's power in Antwerp was not as effective as it was in Spain and Portugal. And so these Portuguese merchants, these new Christians, were able to carry out their business relatively unmolested in Antwerp. But by the beginning, by the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the century, 17th century, Amsterdam became the place to carry out your mercantile business, especially as the Netherlands gained its independence from Spain. And so most of the Portuguese and Spanish Jews who settled in Amsterdam at the, in this period ended up along that broad street there or the island just above it where Manasseh's home was. Um, the, the poorer Jews, those who were not um, as well off, not professionals, not of strong business backgrounds, tended to settle on that island, the Vloyenburg Island. Um, the wealthier families settled along the broad street um, and if I had a pointer, I'd show you Manas um, Rembrandt's house is right on that broad street. If you've been to Amsterdam recently and you've been to the Rembrandt Museum, Rembrandt House Museum, it's right there. Um, and he lived next to, um, right in the midst of the Jewish neighborhood. This was not a ghetto. Jews could live anywhere they wanted in Amsterdam. They were not compelled to wear any special clothing or marks. Amsterdam was a relatively tolerant place. In fact, if you were a Jew, it was a better place to be than if you were a Catholic. There's a story about how one day the, uh, the sheriff and his deputies were walking past a house and they heard some strange sounds coming from a basement and they thought, aha, we caught those Catholics because this was the Calvinist nation recently liberated from Spain and they weren't about to allow Catholicism to be openly practiced. So the sheriff and his men burst into the house and arrested everybody thinking that there was a secret Catholic mass being practiced in this home. When it was explained to them that, in fact, these were not Catholics but Jews, and that the strange sounds they heard were not Latin but Hebrew, everybody was released with apologies. Until about the late 1630s, early 1640s, the Portuguese Jews were the only Jews in town. Ashkenazic Jews started settling around that time in larger numbers. And there was no love lost between these two communities. The Sephardic Jews tended to be well-off merchants or professionals, um, physicians, um, um, intellectuals, um, governing the sugar trade with Brazil, uh, the wood trade with the New World, and also um, shipping goods up to the northern, um, northern states. The Ashkenazim who arrived in Amsterdam were, were generally very poor and a bit of an embarrassment to the Sephardic Jews. The Sephardic Jews, if you look at portraits from this period, the Sephardic Jews, uh, the portraits that we know are of Portuguese Jews, um, they dress like the Dutch, they cut their hair and their beards like the Dutch. Um, it's, it's, it would go too far to say they were assimilated, but they were well off um, and uh, much less noticeable than the Ashkenazic, the poor Ashkenazic Jews settling on that island. Um, at the same time, the Ashkenazic Jews were, had not been cut off for generations from Jewish texts and practices and learning the way in which the Portuguese Jews had been. Uh, and so at the, at the same time that the Sephardic Jews were embarrassed by the poverty of the Ashkenazic Jews, I think they were also humbled by the learning 
which led them at some point to begin taking up charitable collections to send the Ashkenazic Jews back to uh, Poland, Lithuania, or wherever else they had come. There was really no love lost between these two communities. And in fact, um, it would be frowned upon if a member of the Portuguese community uh, married a member of the Ashkenazic community. By 1618, there were three congregations among the Portuguese Jews, Beth Jacob, Beth Israel, and Neve Shalom. And eventually, by 1639, they realized that this arrangement was too awkward. And uh, in 1639, the three congregations merged and began meeting in this lovely building, um, one of, uh, a former mansion of one of the members of the community. At the age of 18, Manasseh was appointed rabbi of the Neva Shalom community. Um, so I guess as young as, as Rabbi Witkowski is, you're a late bloomer by, <laughs> by 17th century Dutch standards. Um, however, he was the lowest paid of the four rabbis, the four main rabbis of the community, and he was giving the lowest level of teaching. He was allowed to teach introductory Hebrew to children, but he was never allowed to teach in the higher levels of the community. I think the other rabbis simply did not have enough respect for his learning. In order to supplement his salary, uh, in 1626, he goes into the printing business. He has um, a fairly large uh, collection of Hebrew type created just for him. And he is the first Hebrew printer in Amsterdam and would eventually become the most important Hebrew publisher in Europe. He published works in Hebrew, but also works in Latin, Spanish, Yiddish, and even English and Dutch. He published Torahs, Bibles, Mishnayot, Talmuds, rabbinic texts, poetry, fiction. Um, because of Manasseh, um, Amsterdam was the center of Jewish publishing in Europe in the 17th century, while Amsterdam itself became the center of literary publishing generally. Things that couldn't get published elsewhere because of censorship, say in London or Paris, could get published in Amsterdam, although sometimes if you wanted to be cautious, you would not put your name on the cover, neither the publisher's name or even the city's name. Manasseh's own writings made him the go-to person for all things Jewish. And to the Gentile world, Manasseh was the rabbi, a consultant for anybody who wanted to know what was the Jewish view on this or that topic. This is a letter from Manasseh, um, and there you see his signature. Um, yeah, he had, he had beautiful, although I should say he, he had beautiful handwriting, but we don't know. Um, this is probably a clean copy. It may have been cleaned up by a scribe, by one of his sons, or it's probably his own handwriting. Um, and this is his letter to Isaac Valshus, one of the leading intellectuals of the period. Um, Manasseh took it upon himself to explain Jewish matters, whether we're talking about historical matters, biblical matters, or theological matters, to Gentiles who would write to him and ask him, what is the Jewish view on this or that topic? So for example, at one point he received an inquiry, what did Jews believe about how much control a person has on how long their life will be? A rigid Calvinist would say, you have no control whatsoever. God has predestined everybody to their fate. There is no free will. And the term of your life, this is the phrase that was used, the term of your life was set by God. But then they asked Manasseh, well, what do the Jews think about this? And Manasseh replied, as a firm believer in free will, that while there were certain parameters to a human life set by God, every individual human being has the power to make their life longer or shorter, uh, longer or shorter, depending upon their acts, their good works, their virtue. You could take advantage of the kind of aid that God provides us through nature and make your life longer, or through a life of vicious activity, you could ensure that your life would end sooner than perhaps its natural course would be. Manasseh also engaged in theological debates with Gentiles, and this was strictly forbidden by the Amsterdam Jewish community. One of its regulations says explicitly, you may not engage in theological debates with Gentiles, but Manasseh nonetheless did so. And this, among other things, did not endear him to the leaders of the community. And as we'll see in a little bit, it earned him a harem or an excommunication for, at a certain period. Here's uh, the title page of perhaps his most famous work, The Conciliador. 
This was a four-volume treatise composed over 20 years. And his project here was to reconcile every single inconsistency in the Hebrew Bible. Every single contradiction. So for example, you have the creation story. One says God created the heavens and the earth. But in another passage it said God created the earth and the heavens. Which came first? Manasseh decided, using Talmudic sources, Kabbalistic sources, philosophical sources, and other theological writings, he decided he was able to reconcile these two, um, referring both to the, the opinion of Shammah, the opinion of Hillel. Then we had the problem of whether uh, man and woman were created at the same time, or was man created first and woman created from man, and he took it upon himself to reconcile um, that contradiction. And this goes on for four, four volumes. He wrote works on the immortality of the soul. He argued that the human soul is not made up of matter, but a, re a very fine spiritual substance. And so when the human body dies and decays, the soul is released and will enjoy a disembodied immortality. He wrote a work uh, defending the rabbinic doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. He wrote a book called 36 Problems About Creation. How did creation take place? When were the angels created? Uh, when were the demons created? What's the role of the demons in the world? He wrote a treatise defending his view on free will. In general, he was writing both for Jewish audiences. Um, one of his works is um, a, a thesaurus of customs for Portuguese Jew, uh, new Portuguese Jews, that is people who are unfamiliar with normative Jewish practice and having recently arrived from Portugal or Spain or elsewhere, needed some kind of guide as to how to lead a normative Jewish life. And this is a long treatise with a final section on, on uh, dietary customs, uh, the proper behavior of a Jewish woman in the home, um, hoping to become uh, not just a, a philosophical theologian, but a, a practical consultant for the Jewish home in Amsterdam. At the same time, writing for Gentiles, he sought a kind of ecumenical co-understanding without giving up too much. He seems to have known what the limits were. So in a Calvinist country, if you're going to write a book defending an absolute freedom of the will, you have to be very careful because the Dutch Reformed Church did not believe in freedom of the will. And this kind of thing brought him a good deal of trouble from within the community. Even though the Netherlands was not about to make the same mistake that Spain had made in 1492 and expelled its Jews, um, the Netherlands knew that these Portuguese merchants made too important a contribution to their economy. They were not going to expel them. And yet, at the same time, you see a very clear sense of insecurity among the Portuguese Jews, even as late as the 1670s. In their regulations, you see them um, making sure that the Purim celebrations are not too loud and ostentatious, and that maybe the wedding parties should tone it down a bit and take it inside. They were very conscious about how the Dutch were perceiving them. And I think this also may have played a role in such events as the excommunication of Spinoza, which may have been the Portuguese Jews' way of saying to the Dutch, hey, don't worry about us. We can keep our house clean. We're not going to be a haven for heretics. What really mattered to Manasseh? Well, for one thing, if you look at his uh, more philosophical treatises, he defended, and this is part of his ecumenical project, he defended the universality of God's salvation to all virtuous people, not just Jews. God's providence extended to all individuals, whatever their faith may be, as long as they led a virtuous life. He also emphasized human responsibility through free will for an individual's own fate. If you're going to earn a reward in the world to come, it's up to you to do so. There is no predestiny. He also was deeply committed to a strong messianic vision. There was going to come a fifth kingdom brought in by the Messiah. The fifth kingdom, the messianic era, for Manasseh at least, is this world. It's not some other world. And here he seems to agree with Maimonides that the Messianic era is going to be a, a kingdom, uh, the, the regathering of the Jews under their own sovereignty, under a Jewish king, in this world, an era of peace and harmony. 
He was also devoted not just to educating former conversos in Judaism, but to educating Gentiles about and trying to dispel the various myths and prejudices and superstitions about the Jews. Now, if you, in tandem with that, um, Manasseh himself was given to various superstitious beliefs. I wouldn't call him a rationalist, um, despite the fact that he was very well trained in Maimonidean philosophy. He used philosophical and logical argumentation. Manasseh himself was a messianist. He believed deeply in the coming of the Messiah. And in fact, certain events in the 1650s led him to believe that that was going to happen very soon. A man named Montezino came to Amsterdam from recent travels in South America and claims to have found one of the lost tribes of Israel. Now, there were rumors in this period that, in fact, the, uh, the native peoples of the New World were, were the lost tribes, all of them. Montezino didn't claim that. He did claim, though, that he came across his travels in Brazil, uh, I'm sorry, in what's now Colombia. He came across a tribe that claimed, that spoke Hebrew and claimed to be descendants of the tribe of Reuben. And this sent uh, Manasseh into a kind of messianic, um, a messianic frenzy. He realized that if this is the case, then we're almost at the point where the prophecy that the Messiah will come when the Jews have been scattered to all ends of the earth. If Jews are everywhere, it must be that the Messiah is near. However, there's still one country and I don't know why he focused on this one country, because there were several countries, but there was still one country where the Jews were f legally forbidden, England. And so in 1655, Manasseh took on his largest uh, and final, sadly, his final project of his life, which is to, um, to work for the readmission of the Jews to England. He went over to England in 1656 after having sent his son over there ahead of time to scope out uh, things. He met with Cromwell, and in fact claimed that Cromwell himself had invited him. And Cromwell, we believe, was very sympathetic to readmitting the Jews. Uh, Manasseh made both theological and economic arguments. The theological argument, which really didn't interest Cromwell very much, was this, the, uh, for, the forecoming of the, of the Messiah. But the economic argument, um, Manasseh pointed to the fact that every country that allowed the Jews to settle reaped economic rewards. Man, uh, Cromwell was persuaded, but unfortunately, Parliament was not. And the, the Whitehall Conference, which Cromwell convened to consider the issue, ended without making a final decision. And Manasseh was, was crushed by, by what he saw as the failure of this. What devastated him even more is that while he was in England, his son died. And so he took his son back across uh, the channel to um, the Netherlands, buried his son, and a few weeks later, he died himself. I would say his life uh, earlier, somebody asked me, is he, was he a likable fellow? I, I think likable might not be the right word, especially if you were a leader of the Portuguese Jews of Amsterdam. He was, a, he was trouble. He was insubordinate. At one point, he resented the way the leaders of the community had treated his brother-in-law. They thought that they treated him disrespectfully. And so he started haranguing them, and they said, be quiet, and that just incited him more. Uh, he followed them out, and they said, if you don't shut up, we're going to put you under harem, which is a, a kind of ostracism or excommunication. That incited him even more, and so Manasseh was put under harem for a day um, and relieved of his rabbinical duties for a year. He was also frequently engaged in fights with one of the other, not physical fights, um, liturgical fights with one of the other rabbis, uh, the chief rabbi, Saul David Mortera. And we find in the, in the um, archives of the Portuguese Jewish community um, reprimands from the leaders of the community to these two rabbis several times saying, cut it out. The sniping from the pulpit is not, it's, it's not allowed. This can't go on. Um, or you'll be put under harem. He was insubordinate, he was independent-minded, uh, and he was, a, I think in some ways, maybe not a great thinker, but of great learning. Uh, he wasn't, he didn't have the, the depth of mind of a Maimonides or even of a Rabbi Mortera, but I think his writings, if anything, 
gave luster to the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam for its learning. I want to uh, close with one final issue um, because there are rumors that Manasseh and Rembrandt were not just neighbors but great friends. Um, this is a myth especially in the Rembrandt literature where Rembrandt is often um, romanticized as the great lover and friend to the Jews and he had a special affection for the Jewish people. Um, and I think that is just mythology. Um, there's no good reasons. We have no good documentary reasons for thinking that Rembrandt had any special fascination or uh, empathy for the Jewish people. All those portraits by Rembrandt that you see that have titles, Portrait of a Jew, Old Jew, Old Rabbi, these are titles that were only given to these works in the 18th century by catalogers. They were not given by um, Rembrandt himself. And among the myths about Rembrandt is that he and Manasseh were, were close friends and collaborators on a number of projects. On one of those projects, I think we can be fairly certain they did collaborate. And that is uh, this painting, Belshazzar's Feast. This is a painting from around 1635. Uh, Belshazzar was giving a, um, a party using the vessels that had been brought back from the temple in Jerusalem, uh, brought back to, to uh, Babylon. And in the middle of the festivities, uh, a mysterious hand came out of nowhere and started writing on the wall. And nobody in Belshazzar's court could make sense of the writing. And in the Talmud, you actually see a rabbinical discussions of this episode from the book of Daniel, um, with the rabbis offering different explanations as to why nobody could read the writing. What, what was going on there? So one rabbi suggests, well, because it was written backwards. Another rabbi suggests it was in code. And yet another rabbi says, well, it was written right to left, <clears throat> as, as Hebrew or Aramaic would be. But rather than going horizontally, it was written vertically. And that's how you see it here. Uh, many, many tekelu farsin going uh, down from right to left. Which uh, the message essentially, uh, as Daniel the prophet, um, what he was called in to read the words, the message is your days are numbered because these are declining units of measure. When Rembrandt painted this work, we want to know, well, first of all, where did he get the, the confidence and the understanding to paint the Hebrew? And why did he use that solution? Because in the literature, in the rabbinic literature, there are various solutions to this puzzle as to what, how the words were written. Well, I think the answer is almost certainly that he got that solution from Manasseh. Because in a book published um, just a few years later, uh, uh, the book called uh, on, the, on the End of Life, The Term of Life, uh, Manasseh says this is how the words were written. Many, many tekelu farsim. Now, the book was published, as I said, a few years after the painting, but this is something that Manasseh must have been thinking about for a while. It ended up in his book. And so when Rembrandt wanted to know, or some advice on, well, how should I make those words appear in the Belshazzar painting, Manasseh said, just like that. The other episode concerns um, a collaboration going the other way. Manasseh published a book called The Glorious Stone, in which he argues that there's a rock that keeps appearing throughout various episodes of the Hebrew Bible. It's the rock on which Jacob lays his head when he has his dream. It's the rock that David uses to slay uh, the, the uh, Philistine giant Goliath. Um, and the rock represents, in Manasseh's reading, because it, it, in the later episode, it, it crashes a, um, I'm sorry, it destroys a statue. Um, and Manasseh says this rock is the Messiah. And the kingdoms destroyed by the rock are the ancient kingdoms that the Messiah's coming will wipe away. He published this book in 1655. And in the first edition, or in some copies of the first edition of the book, there are etchings by Rembrandt. And these are the four etchings. So on the, on the upper left, you have the, the statue representing the, the kingdoms being toppled by the rock. Um, here you have David slaying Goliath. Um, here you have Jacob dreaming uh, with the angels going up and down the ladder while his head rests on the rock. And in the upper right hand, you have uh, Daniel's vision of the beasts. And in that upper right hand etching is a representation of God. 
In a subsequent edition, these etchings do not appear, but they are replaced by similar etchings by Salam Italia, the same Jewish artist who we saw did that portrait of Manasseh earlier. Um, with the difference that not only are they not great etchings, they're not, re you know, Salam Italia was no Rembrandt, um, but also in that upper right hand etching, uh, Italia eliminated the representation of God. And so there's a great deal of discussion about what was Rembrandt's relationship to this project. Did he, did Manasseh ask him to do these etchings? Was it really a collaboration? Or was it that some early owner of that first edition, perhaps Isaac Valshus, <laughs> whose letter we saw earlier, um, who had connections with connections with Rembrandt, perhaps asked Rembrandt to make etchings for his copy. Um, but maybe there was no collaboration between Manasseh and Rembrandt at all. This remains one of the ongoing um, do I have one more slide? No, that was it. This remains one of the sort of the ongoing um, mysteries uh, in Manasseh's life. What really is the truth of his relationship to Rembrandt? But I think we'll never really have the answers unless there's some documentation that shows up. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to open this up to questions, if that's all right with you. Yeah. All right, we have some from the live stream. They've already come in. Um, this is, let's pick them on the radio show. Call I know. Call <laughs> in. It's 555. So, um, so we're going to ask one of the ones from our global community, while people here have a chance to think about questions they want. So um, from, this is from, oh, we have names. This is nice. We have from Leo. Whatever happened to Manasseh's idea of the 10 lost tribes having reappeared in South America? And I'm going to add to that, so who were the people that Montezino, I can't, Ma say, Montezino. I can't say any of the names in this book, by the way. Manasseh, I can say. The rest, <laughs> I can't. Um, what, who were the people that he met? And like, do, we ever, do we know who these people on the other side of the river that spoke Hebrew? Or was that all a fabrication just to... I buy drinks in Amsterdam. All right, so uh, what sorry. happened to this idea and who were those people? Um, we don't know who those people were. Um, the only evidence we have is Montezino's report. Um, there's really no good reason to distrust it. Um, Manasseh did not think, contrary to some of his English correspondence, he did not think that these were the 10 lost tribes. He thinks the most likely explanation is that um, the, the tribe that Montezino came across, these descendants of the tribe of Reuben, actually came um, from, the south, from islands in the South China Sea. So if, I guess if you wanted to plot some kind of, of transit there, moving eastward slowly, um, and at some point perhaps a land bridge between South America and these islands of Southeast Asia allowed these people to end up um, in, um, in New Spain. Um, what happened to them? Who knows? Uh, we do know that the Messiah did not arrive in, in 1656. The Messiah did come in 1666, uh, but then converted to Islam. Is that, that, that's not a joke. Um, in 1666, Sabatai Zvi um, proclaimed himself the Messiah. This caused an enormous uproar in Europe and the Amsterdam Portuguese community especially was taken with this frenzy. People were selling their homes, selling their businesses, and all moving to, um, to Jerusalem. And then um, the, um, the Messiah was captured by uh, the Islamic rulers of the land and forced to convert. Um, we have here, we'll go question, question here, question from the live stream. We'll go back and forth. What made the famous or uh, so uh, he was noted as the most uh, important Jew in Amsterdam <coughs> and I think in, in the book it was mentioned some English visitors came and, and, and came to him and not to the more important rabbis at the time. Uh, was it his writings or his, uh, his books or uh, just by word of mouth they said this is the man to see open to discussion with the non-Jewish world? I think it's all of those things. Uh, first of all, when you own your own printing press, you have a bit of an advantage. Uh, 
Um, and he was, he wrote more, as far as I know, he wrote more than any other rabbi of the period, in, sorry, any of the other Amsterdam rabbis. Uh, he wrote a lot. Uh, in fact, if you want to go, I can direct you online, and a lot of these are, uh, a lot of his texts are online. Um, and he wrote in Spanish, uh, he wrote in Portuguese, he wrote in Dutch, he wrote in English. Um, and so his writings, but also the fame that he brought himself into the community uh, through his publishing business. I also think he must have been a fairly charismatic individual. My, my great regret is that he was not in Amsterdam, maybe this is uh, Spinoza's regret too, that he was not in Amsterdam when the excommunication of Spinoza took place. This is something I'm going to talk about tomorrow night, the excommunication of Spinoza. Um, we don't know what he thought about this, but having himself chafed under the authority of the leaders of the community and have, having received his own harem, um, you, he probably was, I, I don't think you can say Spinoza was his student, but he was probably not very happy with the way in which the leaders of the community uh, wielded this very harsh form of punishment. Um, we're going we're gonna to go to one from the live stream, because it's, this is, we're, you're international, by the way. Well. This is from Martin in Jerusalem. Martin, I'm going to try to paraphrase your, I don't know how you got that onto Twitter. It was a lot of uh, words. But so Martin asked basically about how if, if uh, Spinoza, if Manasseh ben Israel comes from a, a family of conversos and part of this long sort of generation of new Christians, where does his Jewish knowledge come from? That's a great question um, because we don't, I, th I think it's, we know it that his family, while in Portugal, was a Judaizing family. The, in, the, in this case, the Inquisition's suspicions were correct. Um, and they fled. We don't know what kind of Judaism, especially this family, practiced in Portugal and Madeira and La Rochelle. But it doesn't really matter because when they got to Amsterdam, Manasseh was six years old. And he studied under Isaac Uziel, who was at that point the chief rabbi of the congregation that his family belonged to, the Beth Jacob congregation. I think it was Beth Jacob, I don't remember. Um, and Uziel was a learned. The, the, uh, the community, because it was a new community of former conversos, they had to bring in rabbis from elsewhere. Uh, rabbis from Fez in Morocco, from Salonika. Uh, rabbi Mortera came from Venice. And these were learned educators. And, and Manasseh got a superb education from Isaac Uziel. Um, and um, he was a, Uziel had a reputation for being stern uh, and sometimes a little bit cruel. But that's where Manasseh um, got it. So I'm going to ask a follow-up question on the Spinoza question in relationship to Manasseh and Israel. Um, when you're talking about the salvation issue, the one you mentioned in your talk, um, you actually have a quote that says, and in, in referencing the virtue of, of people who are entitled to salvation, he refers to both the law of Moses and the law of nature. And that stuck out to me because it is a very spinoza in thing to say. And so the question is, not so much what influence Manasseh had on Spinoza, but what influence Spinoza had on Manasseh. <laughs> Well, that, that's, a, um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think if, if I had to answer that, um, so here, here's my speculation. Um, very little, only because Manasseh left Amsterdam in 1656 when Spinoza was only 23 years old. Um, I do think that Spinoza was already entertaining his heretical ideas at that point. I think the, the harem was based on his ideas. It wasn't based on financial irregularities or other things. Um, when Manasseh speaks of the law of Moses and the law of nature, unlike Spinoza, he does not identify them. He thinks that the law of Moses does have a rational basis, but unlike Spinoza, well, I'm sorry, Spinoza doesn't identify them in the sense that the, law of, the laws of Moses, that is the ceremonial laws, for Spinoza, these are superstitious rituals um, invented for a very specific historical period and political purpose. The law of nature is discovered by reason. Um, Manasseh would agree with that. Um, I don't think, despite the myths that Manasseh himself, given his somewhat free-thinking ways, 
Um, the myth is that Manasseh was an important influence on Spinoza. I don't think that's the case at all. I think there's, because of Manasseh's messianism, um, his, the touch of Kabbalism that you often find in his works, uh, because of his devotion to a robust doctrine of immortality and a strong doctrine of free will, uh, on these matters, Manasseh and Spinoza are diametrically opposites. Um, I hesitate to say that Spinoza did really, it's an interesting question, but I'm not going to commit myself to <laughs> that one. But I, I, let me just say one thing. The, the culprit here, I think the culprit that, if you want to bring Manasseh and Spinoza together, the culprit is Amsterdam. This cosmopolitan, philosophically, theologically rich city uh, that tolerated um, all these ideas and all these publications. I just want to ask you about the, the historiography of what you're saying. Uh, my understanding is that the when you talked about fear, the Grotius who first suggested well, with another person that the Jews be allowed in was relatively promptly exiled, and a number of the other quote unquote freer, more tolerant thinkers were as well. It's also the case that the Dutch law formally discriminated against Jews until 1796, and no other religion, including Judaism, was allowed to have any place uh, establishment for worship until um, then, although the exception was made for uh, the wealthy communities. Nobody quite has been able to explain to me how that occurred, but it was not within the bounds of Dutch law at the time until 1796. What do you mean, except for Jews? No, no, none of them. Uh, the, the, what your example of the Catholics was right. They discriminated harshly against Methodists and all kinds of other people. Right, but not to, the Jews were allowed to build their synagogues. They, they were, but not, it was not within law. It was typical Dutch. It was an arrangement that somehow happened because of their financial power, as you described it, okay. the community sugar trade and other trades that they were very uh, well placed in and were very important. But I think that the... Um, the fear element, we know that the highest percentage of loss in Europe and the Holocaust was in Holland because the level of anti-Semitism and collaboration is 92% loss. And so I think that the, you have to be clear on the historiography that there was real fear uh, and there were real things that were happening, not just the exiles of Russians and other people, but there were periodic, each state was a different ruler and different views and, uh, and very often they came down very harshly. It was a very much catch as catch can. We're going to remind you to just ask the question. No, that's absolutely right. Um, Amsterdam was Amsterdam, and Utrecht was Utrecht. And what might be allowed in one province or one city would not necessarily be allowed at, in another. Moreover, the the um, the waters of Dutch politics were always shifting. Uh, 1650 to 1672 was a period of the true freedom, and the more liberal regions. Um, were able to um, sort of ignore, at least um, put off the more intolerant elements of the Dutch Reformed Church. So yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I do think, though, however, in Amsterdam, despite the fact that um, emancipation didn't come till the French invasion, the um, formal recognition, formal allowance of Jewish worship came in the 17th century in, in Amsterdam. I'm curious about your access to the Inquisition documentation, so that you actually found Gaspard's uh, experience. Did they keep records? Did you have that, or did, was that something anecdotal out of Manassas? They kept very good records. I mean, this is the Inquisition. To, uh, um, hundred plus years? Of, did they well, they've, they've, the relevant records for my case, uh, for Manasseh's case, um, have all been transcribed. I wasn't going through inquisitional archives. I don't, I don't have paleographical skills, so I would not be able to read 17th century uh, Hispanic literature, uh, handwritten literature. Um, so all the relevant documents, um, if not published, have been transcribed, and they're accessible. And a lot of stuff is accessible online. The Portuguese Jewish archives in the, municipal, in the municipal archives of Amsterdam are, are, well, a lot of them are online and more is being put online. Notary records and a lot of what we know about Manasseh's business practices we have from notary documents of the period.
take a question if that's okay with everybody. And then we also have another one from, from Twitter here. Um, so it feels like you're set, you set up, in many ways, Manassas, I mean, his, the title of his book is like the conciliatory, and that seems to be the, the narrative you're, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that you seem to be showing is that this great trauma that happened to his family, he then spent his entire life, Manasseh does, trying to bring these two sides together. Right? He just seems very much against conflict. You know? Verses can't disagree. Religions can't disagree. Everybody's gonna, it's, it's gonna be okay, right? There seems to be this almost, almost frenetic um, desire to end conflict. Um, is that, am I reading that right in what you're trying to say? Do we have that, that explicitly from him or do we have to infer it from the nature of his work? There are passages, <laughs> there are passages in which he says, uh, speaking to a Gentile um, correspondent, that uh, your religion and my religion are not that far apart. And there was a Gentile uh, correspondent um, and a friend of his, yeah, who wrote, that, who wrote a poem um, and um, took things even a little bit too far for, and was um, punished for that, arguing that uh, Jews and Christians worship, this, uh, they're equal in God's eyes. Um, my, initial, my, my original subtitle for the book was The Conciliator. Um, and the press didn't like that. My second original title was The Most Famous Jew in the World. Uh, the press didn't like that. So we went with the Rabbi of Amsterdam, um, which is true. <laughs> but, you know, not a, not a blockbuster subtitle. Um, we're going we're gonna to take our last one from Twitter. Was Manasseh actually a Kabbalist? What part of his thinking may be attributed to his Kabbalistic view? So he was not as much of a Kabbalist as one of the other rabbis in the community, Isaac Abob de Fonseca, who was, uh, whose Kabbalistic writings are not just... So Manasseh mostly, uh, when he uses Kabbalah, it's quotes among many other quotes to support whatever point he's trying to make. He'll quote from Plato and Aristotle and Kabbalah and Hebrew scripture and Maimonides and uh, Ibn Ezra, just incredible, and even sometimes a Christian theologian, just an incredible wealth of references. Um, and so what we can say is that he was familiar with Kabbalah. I, I have not found a Kabbalistic text in which we have an analysis of the Sefirot and uh, an application of Kabbalah to, uh, let's say, the fate of human beings or the nature of the cosmos. So I wouldn't say he's an original and deep Kabbalistic thinker. He seems to have been very familiar with Kabbalistic texts, a, a limited uh, number of them, um, but certainly not at the level of somebody like Rabbi Abouab was. So I have another, which is about um, dedications. I, don't, I didn't know this, so it seems like the, to whom Manasseh ben Israel dedicated a book, was a way of, it was, um, I think of a book dedication as a thanking someone that's already done something nice right. for you. And he seemed to be using them as ways to try to curry favors in the future. Was that a common practice of the day? Or is this a, an innovation or a desperation move by Vanessa? It was a common practice of the day. So at one point he dedicated a book to the, uh, to the theologians of Leiden hoping it would earn him their favor, but in fact, it just pissed them off. Um, Descartes, for example, dedicates his meditations to the theologians of the Sorbonne, hoping to get them to approve the text. And for a long time, we thought that, in fact, they didn't approve it, but recently, well, in the last 10 years or so, um, it was discovered that, in fact, that the Sorbonne did approve Descartes. So sometimes it's effective, sometimes it works against you. Uh, it may be that the Leiden theologians did not want to be associated with this project and resented being having their name put on it. I dedicated my book to my family, hoping it would earn me some good credit there. I like the way you think. A, they haven't even read it. I'm, I'm curious to hear um, what you think is the legacy of this individual and I'm also curious to know what the legacy is of the family. Whatever happened to the rest of his 
people? That's a great question. Um, let me start with the family. Um, nothing. So he had, he had two sons and a daughter. Um, the first son died on a book buying trip. So Manasseh was not just a publisher, but a bookseller. And he would send his son to the Frankfurt Book Fair. Um, and on one of those trips eastward, he died. Uh, the second son died in England on the, uh, the mission to Cromwell. Uh, his daughter married, but we really hear nothing. We know nothing about her. All we know is that she married, and we know who she married. Um, his wife, um, Rachel Abravanel, claimed to have been from the famous Abravanel family. Um, and when Manasseh himself died, she was living in such poverty that she made several attempts writing to England, either directly or through emissaries, to try to get some of the money that she felt Cromwell owed her husband. Um, so we know that she, she probably died as well in great poverty, but we don't know when. In terms of his legacy, um, well, let me ask you this. How many of you have had heard of Manasseh ben Israel? There you go. <laughs> um, I, I think his legacy is uh, established primarily through people who are familiar with Spinoza, because there's this myth that he was Spinoza's teacher, going back to your question about the influence. Um, or people who have studied the history of Jewish Amsterdam, or people who have studied the readmission of the Jews to England. But that's mostly scholarship. Um, Manasseh has not entered the popular imagination the way in which, say, Maimonides or Spinoza has. And I think it's a great shame because he really does hold a significant place as, a, as an unorthodox, orthodox thinker in the 17th century who really pushed the boundaries of what a Jewish community could achieve in a Gentile world. And what the kind of outreach that he engaged in, I think set a very high standard for what was to come. But the fact that, you know, I, I'm grateful to the Jewish Live Series and to Yale University Press for taking on a character like this, who they knew was not um, a marquee name. It's, it's, Manasseh is no Barbara Streisand. <laughs> Yes. They asked me what I do a volume on Spinoza, and I said, "Well, I've already written a, a, a biography of Spinoza. I really don't want to do it again." Um, but what about Manasseh in Israel? And they said, "Who?" <laughs> um, but fortunately, the the academic editors of the Steve Zipperstein and the academic editors of the series thought it was a good idea, and I'm grateful that they took it on. So my real question was. Oh. That came up was, you kind of said that, you know, in the Netherlands, there were such differences of tolerance in each um, you know, community. So how did people know where there were tolerant communities? I mean, it wasn't like we had, you know, the same communication systems. Right well, the Netherlands is a small place. And, um, well, some cities, so... When, when the Jews came from all over the world, why did they know to go to Amsterdam? Well, because it was a small world. Um, the, these, well, it was, if, it was in the Sephardic diaspora. Um, the Venice community, for example, was extremely important for the Amsterdam community as a kind of mentoring community. And so when, they, when the Amsterdam community had issues that needed to be resolved, they would often consult with the Venetian rabbis uh, and Hamburg as well. And so there was a, there was a very uh, strong network of communication among these communities, and they knew. Uh, within the Netherlands, um, some cities went out of their way to welcome or to invite Jews. So when Amsterdam was dragging its feet at the beginning of the 17th century, Harlem, thinking of, their, of the economic opportunities, said, well, come to Harlem. So, I mean, it's, you know, there, was no, <laughs> there was no internet, and it's not the kind of lightning fast communications we have, but word got around, especially because the Portuguese Jews had... Uh, whatever the religious networks may have been, there were these mercantile networks. And they were all in business together, uh, covering the same um, colonial um, trades. Wait, sorry. I have two questions, if it's permitted. One was, I'm just curious, with the Inquisition, with its eye on this family, how did they escape? Was it easy to escape? Or did they have to go all through these uh, complicated moves of the Inquisition just happy for them to go. And two, um, I found the, the part of the book uh, dealing with the debates to let the Jews come back into England fascinating historically. 
And I'm wondering, although he didn't live to see it, were his efforts part of the decision? Did he influence the decision for the Jews to come back to England? It's hard to say, um, because th there were some Portuguese, again, Portuguese merchants or uh, physicians living in London at the time. But it was a well-known secret that they were Jews. So there was a small Jewish community. And their attitude towards Manasseh's efforts was very ambivalent, because they thought he stirred things up and drew attention to them, attention that they probably would have preferred not to have. Um, when, I mean, it, it, true, um, true admission was a long time coming. It was several decades later. And you don't see a lot of, as far as I know, you don't see a lot of gratitude expressed towards Manasseh for what he may have done. But I, I think the role he played is undeniably important. Um, how did they leave Portugal? Um, a lot, so we don't know exactly when they did. And this notion that they first went to Madeira and then La Rochelle, that's, that's based on some good evidence, but it's not absolutely certain. A lot of families went back through Spain and then through the Pyrenees. Um, but as far as I know, um, well, the difference between Spain and Portugal, in 1492, Spain said, convert or leave. Portugal said, and then a lot of them went to Portugal. And then when Portugal in, six, in 1496 um, laid down their law, they said, convert or leave, but you can't leave. Um, and so it was much more difficult to leave Portugal um, than Spain. But the, the mechanisms for leaving, I'm afraid I don't know that much about it. Uh, I'm a descendant of uh, the Sephardi community in London. My grandfather and father emigrated to America from the Sephardi community. What's your last name? Uh, they, uh, that's a long story. Oh. <laughs> they, uh, cats. They, they bought a passport. They couldn't get to America. Oh, yeah. I'm an illegal immigrant, you know. I sympathize with all those that are trying to dream this. Uh, but um, in, uh, in any event, um, oh, my first synagogue here was the Spanish Portuguese and I was in the synagogue as by my grandfather right here in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was very interesting to me that, that the uh, Jewish community uh, was restarted on the Cromwell, who was very sympathetic, as you mentioned. But wasn't there, after Cromwell, wasn't there a counter-revolution? And what happened to the Jews? How did they fare? It, I mean, it's beyond the books uh, 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 that you mentioned. But I'm just interested to see if they if they were uh, persecuted after uh, Cromwell's uh, departure. So Cromwell's uh, first successor was Richard, his son, who I don't think was as favorable towards Jewish readmission as his father was. Uh, Parliament, um, and again, this, I'm, I'm not an expert on this phase of British history, but because Parliament um, under Cromwell was, were the ones who were resistant to Jewish readmission, um, then when the, um, um, the reestablishment of the king, um, James, uh, Charles II, um, was more favorable. But I've, I've had a lot of trouble pinpointing the exact year that readmission became formal. You see different things said over by different scholars. Um, but I, I do know that um, Charles was more favorable, but I, I couldn't tell you the exact year that readmission became formal. Is it, maybe somebody in this room knows. Yeah. Uh, does the Anglo Saxon question? You mean like so. 18, 1858, like that? So, yeah. 1858 was where it was formal. That's what, yeah, but there was in the 17th century about. 10 years after the Whitehall Conference failed, there was a more tacit agreement in the 16, I thought it was in the 1660s. In the, in the book you say that when Charles II comes in, he has a sort of not full acceptance, but a kind of- Wink and a nod. Yeah, but a, yeah. 
So I have, I have one last question before we say uh, good night, and it's also a plug for many of the different things that are going on. Um, see you tomorrow night for dinner and to talk about Spinoza. Um, see you on Saturday to talk about the book about heretics. Uh, also at, at the Met right now is a Dutch Impressionist exhibit. Dutch, no, Dutch, uh, not Impressionist. Not Impressionist. The Dutch, Dutch paintings. Dutch this. paintings, sorry, yeah. excuse me. I just go with, you know. Uh, it's a great exhibit. I remember when I walked by. Um, you, so, you had an impression of it, so. I had an impression of it. Nice. Um, I make the jokes here. I'm oh, sorry. Um, so, but uh, is there, you touch on this in some of the ways that it led to, in many ways, Manasseh's downfall or some of the problems that he, because he ran on the wrong side of the debates that were happening in the Christian world in Amsterdam. And, Armenians and remonstrations. Remonstrations. Thank you. And that, like, to what extent were those debates influencing the debates of the Jewish world in the way that he was, Manas was interacting with the other rabbis of his community? Um, well, in one very practical way, the fact that he was engaging in these debates and taking stances that were diametrically opposed to the Dutch Reformed Church's official views, um, that I caused a great deal of alarm within the Amsterdam community. Um, Rabbi Mortera's, uh, we, what we do have are some polemical writings by Mortera against um, Christian theology, but I don't, I don't see them as responding um, to Manasseh's engagement. I mean, you don't see it. I mean, Mortera's, what we have from him and Mark Saperstein some years ago, did a magnificent edition of Mortera's sermons, but you don't, he didn't take, Mortera did not take Manasseh seriously, and so you don't see him in his theological or philosophical uh, views reflecting any kind of influence by what Manasseh's engagement with the Gentile world. Thank you so much. Thank you.